thank you very much for staying. And again, I hope you enjoyed the, the show. And our post-show uh, post discussion uh, will be chaired by Luke Harding, senior correspondent for The Guardian. Mm -hmm. And uh, Luke will introduce the panel, tonight's panel to you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great reading. I'm absolutely delighted and honored to introduce uh, Yelena Remina, who's the artistic director of Theater Doc in Moscow. Uh, and to my right is uh, Noah Berkset Breen, who, who translated it so wonderfully and has also kind of picked and curated the Russian dramas and plays that you're going to hear uh, this, this week. Um, Yelena just got in from uh, m Moscow. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, I it's a wonderful play. It's black. It's funny. It's kind of terrible. It's very human. What, what do audiences in, in, in Moscow, what do Russian audiences make of this play? Because it's been running now for 10 years. Ну, я поняла, да. Я, я поняла. Я скажу тогда, значит, ну, у нас этот спектакль идет до сих пор. Недавно ему отметили 10 лет. It's been 10 years. It's, uh, this, uh, the show has been running uh, for 10 years in Moscow. И его очень любят зрители. And the audience li like it very much. Uh, at Teatr Dok, it has been running for 10 years. Но тут есть еще особая аудитория. Это культовый спектакль среди врачей. Oh, but there's the <laughs> there's a very special uh, actually <coughs> audience um, as well uh, that that love that uh, play. It's the it's doctors that come and, and watch <laughs> the play. It's <laughs> true. So it's it's a cult a cult play for for the doctors mm -hmm. in the Moscow region. I, uh, for, for, for those who, who may not know Russia, are provincial Russian hospitals really that terrible? Are you are you really? <laughs> Вот мне кажется, все равно, что тут дело всегда в врачах. I still think that probably uh, most of the time it's down to the doctor. И есть такая даже, ну вот в советское время была поговорка uh, про uh, такие партийные роскошные лечебницы. We even had a saying uh, in the Soviet times about the um, lavish um, hospitals that the party members had. Uh, полы паркетные, врачи анкетные. All oh, right. <laughs> so, parquet floors. No, it's a shikarne accrued. Parquet floors. Right. So, parquet floors and um, doctors, um, sort of pa paper doctors, doctors who are kind of stuck with their noses in paperwork rather than actually, you know, being proper doctors. Um, it does sound funny in Russian because uh, because there's there's a rhyme there. Um, it's a, Полы паркетные, врачи анкетные. Парке и анкет, анкет, which is a form, which is a form that that that's around there. Ну вот, поэтому вы и сейчас вы в провинциальных больницах можете попасть к доктору, который вас спасет, потому что он у него интуиция, потому что у него большой опыт. And even nowadays, you can end up um, being lucky and ending up with a very good doctor somewhere in a provincial hospital who is um, who is just has great intuition and great experience and will be able to save you. And then again, in a Moscow, in a Moscow hospital, you might come to uh, lavish hospitals where, in fact, in the foyer, some of them have a, a lady playing the. Um, um, the, ar the harp, the harp, there we yeah. go, the harp. Um, as you enter into the hospital, <laughs> you will have yeah, uh, a musician greeting you. Врачи там очень часто абсолютно как раз заняты только тем, чтобы сделать как бы пациенту очень большой счет. Whereas the doctors are more interested in um, presenting you with a huge bill uh, as a patient rather than actually treating you. И в общем доктор это все равно такая мистическая древняя профессия. So <laughs> doctor is actually uh, Ilen believes the bottom line it is quite a sort of mystic mystical um, tradition um, a sort of a profession which is uh, difficult to define. И как раз из того, что там ужасного происходит, это вот последняя реформа образования, когда вот закрываются 
то есть не, не, не образование, а здравоохранение, mm -hmm. когда в небольших как раз вот эти вот провинциальные больницы, многие из них закрываются, в поселках упраздняются какие-то mm -hmm. лечебные пункты, и просто многие люди вообще остаются без помощи. Вот это самое ужасное. Hospitals being shut and people just have nowhere to turn to. И просто как в Фейсбуке у меня там есть одна из моих френдов, которая работает как раз в маленькой больнице в поселке. One of my friends on Facebook, she works as a doctor in one of those local um, hospitals. Где вокруг нее там ну несколько там десяток деревень, например. And there's about ten villages around that. Um, so. Uh, that hospital um, provides treatment. И там как раз такой персонал, который уже ну, давно работает, всех знает и действительно uh, ну, оказывает помощь вот во, во, вс во всех этих местах. So that hospital is really quite excellent. The, um, the doctors are very well aware of um, the, the, the patients who, who, who comes. They know uh, they have all the experience. И как раз вот сейчас ее закрывают эту больницу. Они пытаются вести какую-то борьбу. So right now it's being shut by the government and the hospital, the doctors are trying to, they're protesting against that closure. Вот. It, it, w w the, um, the, the, uh, there were great moments in the play, but I think my favorite was the philosophical conversation about the surgeon who gets the guy with his guts hanging out, sews him up, he survives, you know, he's, he doesn't press charges. Самое любимое, то, что мне больше всего понравился момент, когда приходится, когда приходится хирургу зашивать человека, и когда у него такие такие осложнения. This is when the lights go. Yeah, yeah, no, no. And then a year later, he 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 murders his wife with a brick at the bus stop. Вот он он убивает свою жену. My question is, you know, to you, should he have done the operation or should he have left left the man to die? What's your answer to the philosophical question? Как вам кажется, ответ на философский вопрос? Должен ли этот врач был своему пациенту помочь или нужно было оставить умирать? Нет, ну конечно же надо врач должен лечить. Of course, the doctor has to heal, has to help. Мне кажется, что лучше, ну вот это то, в чем я не сомневаюсь. This is what I have no, I do not doubt. Okay, but this the 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 play by Yelena Saeva. Хотя, простите, сейчас вот на самом деле клятву Гиппократа. У нас заменили на клятву российского врача, и там вот типа такое, что не всех надо лечить и так далее. Oh, interesting. So Elena says that currently the um, of the oath, Hippocratic oath that the uh, that the doctors give has currently been changed to a new Russian Federation oath, <laughs> which basically says. States that exactly what Luke you were asking <laughs> that <laughs> in some <laughs> cases maybe in some instances <laughs> the doctors don't actually have to help and treat <laughs> their patients. <laughs> so, yeah, so th this philosophical question has been answered by the Russian <laughs> government already. Our law has as well as all the other questions. So the, the Russian law explains everything. Okay, exactly. Well, I'm, I'm very relieved by the <laughs> Never <laughs> doubt the Russian law. But, but uh, you know, I, uh, Noah, we were talking about this earlier on. Um, the, the doctor is a real person. This is a verbatim play. This is a real yeah. doctor yeah. talking yeah. about real experiences. This is not fiction. This is this is true. Yeah. Could you tell us a, a bit about it? I mean, вы знаете, да, это действительно настоящий настоящая персона, очень харизматичный врач. Very charismatic doctor. Вот, и я хочу сказать, что вот это вот у меня было всегда такое ощущение, что когда он давал интервью Леночке Исаевой, and I always had the feeling when he was giving um, uh, his interview to Lena Isaeva. А Лена Исаева, так сказать, это очень симпатичная yeah. девушка, блондинка с голубыми глазами. Лена Исаева is a very good looking girl. She's a blonde, blue-eyed blonde. И, и у нее голос такой, как колокольчик. And her voice just is, is so beautiful. Like little bell. Right? Like little bell. Yeah. Да. И я представляю, почему все картину, как она сидит, записывает и говорит: "Ну и что? И ты отрежь." <laughs> so Elena imagines that Elena Saeva is sat there with her with her laptop and she says, So what happened? Did you cut off his leg? And he goes, Yes, and this happened and then that happened. 
Вот. И вы знаете, я хочу сказать, что вот эта какая-то прекрасная энергия вот того, как вот девушка с хрустальным голоском у такого мачо, так сказать, врача собирает материал, вот эта энергия вошла в спектакль, и мне кажется, она, ну, помогает. So that energy of, of this young, beautiful girl with a bell-like voice and the uh, charisma of that doctor has been through lots. It's, it's, uh, you, you can feel it in the play. It really helps the play. What, what, what I, just finally on this, what, what, what I really like about it is the fact that <laughs> everybody in the play is so human. The doctor is human, but also <laughs> the woman, <laughs> the woman who just goes, you know, he goes, where's the cat go? And she goes, that's all we've got, mate. Uh, I, I mean, мне кажется, что это еще такое вот там очень передано вот это вот медицинское какое-то вот действительно сообщество, потому что я знаю, потому что мой первый дол муж был врач скорой помощи, я тоже знаю этот so вот. Елена feels that this play uh, really um, gives a very good idea of that community, of the, um, the doctors community in Russia um, and what, what they experience. And uh, Елена says that her... Um, Ой, мой первый муж, муж uh, her first, her first husband uh, was a doctor, so she, she really understands. Emergency, emergency. So Yelena's youth, she spent her, her youth amongst those people who, who go to the hospital. So it's all very true. fatalism, So that combination of fatalism, but this urge to really do, do, you know, do your duty, and on the other hand, you have that cynicism. Yes, that's very. That's very. It's very. I think it's very. 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 Uh, you know, and uh, ho hold your life in in, uh, in their hands, and then the next day they just go and go go to a pub or something, do something <laughs> very similar to what, what our normal day would be. Like. I mean, w w one of the many things I, I love about Russia when I live there is is personal relationships. It's all about personal friendships, and I, I love the bit in the play where the two. Where the, the, the doctors have this terrible operation, they get drunk, and they have to write a note saying, yes, we drank 250 milliliters of cognac. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you, and, and in Britain, you would be fired. And in Russia, she just puts the note in the middle of the pile, and life carries on. I thought that was glorious. Ну, я думаю, что я думаю, что это тоже описано все как было. Я думаю, что это реально. I think this is this is true. Да, и там действительно описано. Ну, там описано еще нравы ну провинциальной больницы, где меньше бюрократизма, где я думаю, что сейчас какой-нибудь частной клинике на тебя тут же напишут телегу. But of course we have to remember that this is a provincial hospital and and the daily life of the of the daily hospital. Where you're exactly right, as Luke said, there's it's very important to have that those relationships and there's less bureaucracy. Whereas of course, if if something like that happened in a in a city hospital in somewhere in Moscow, it is possible that you would get fired and somebody would write to the director or whoever to get you fired. Yelena, I, I wanted to, to broaden the discussion and ask you about um, theatre doc. You, you've, you've had a tough, mm. a tough couple of years. I mean, you, you were kicked out of your um, theatre, you were homeless for a bit, now you're back. What, 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 who, who do you think is behind this kind of pressure on you? Um, wh why are you being pressured? Is everyone being pressured or are you being pressured in particular? Было очень тяжелая жизнь, когда доктор был вытащен, когда его закидали в 
страдания, по поводу вроде бы успеха в каких-то области, но от меня откуда, он все равно ощущение, что вы относитесь к так большой, так сказать, признаком, так сказать, да, под давлением. Откуда ну, это давление исходит? Вы знаете, я просто не хочу заниматься какой-то конспирологией и как бы считать Есть какая-то версия, что у нас есть враги в администрации президента. И это про это мне говорили шепотом какие-то люди, так сказать. Я просто стараюсь, чтобы моей, моей жизни не, управляли, не управлялось то, что говорится шепотом. Потому что наши конфликты с властями, которые один был действительно в декабре 2014 -го года, а второй после премьеры нашего спектакля «Болотное дело», 6 мая 2015 и каждый раз начиналось с того, что к нам приходили люди из какие-то значит частью с погонами, частью без и шепотом говорили: мы вам не рекомендуем показывать этот спектакль. Это до до спектакля. До спектакля, да. So before before the play beforehand, some people, um, uh, some in with uniforms, some without, they come to us to to Chester Dock and um, beforehand and whisper in, in ties. We we wouldn't recommend that you show uh, anything tonight. На вопрос, почему, и говорят, нет, это не рекомендовано. И только если начать вот слушать этих голосов, то мне кажется, что это какое-то падение по наклонной плоскости и так далее. Вот. Но действительно, мы два раза теряли наше помещение. И Потому что мы арендуем помещение. We have to hire, we have to hire и те, кто нам дает его арендовать, это слабое звено. So the weak link is, um, is normally the land, the, the landowner, the, the, the landlord. Thank you. Um, yes, so they, they, they're the ones who are going to crush it. Вот. И сейчас, когда вот была uh, последняя история с... Uh, ну вот, в, um, делом uh, со спектаклем «Болотное дело», там как раз сначала наш арендодатель говорил, что ничего страшного, ничего особенного, что в конце концов это всего нам спектакль, значит, а, типа ничего не бойтесь. So at first our landlord, he was alright, but when, when we were uh, about to show Balotne in, in May 2015, uh, the Balotne case, uh, that play, at first our landlord was absolutely fine, he said, oh, it's just a play, of course, there's nothing to worry about, you know. Это большая научная корпорация, у которой мы арендовали это здание. It's a big scientific Corporation that, uh, we've rented the venue from. А через там, неделю после премьеры он мне позвонил упавшим голосом и сказал, Елена, плохие новости, нам uh, велено с вами расторгнуть договор. Да, это причем всегда очень поучительно, когда такой, знаете, человек, молодой, еще обеспеченный, который все время значит, катается где-то на горных лыжах, такой какой-то с мужскими какими-то такими увлечениями, вдруг, когда ему что-то говорят шу, шу шу вдруг он начинает мелко дрожать и делает то, что ему говорят.
So, so, Manush, so, so um, Noah, you wanted to come in there, yeah? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, just to say as well that uh, for anyone who's not uh, kind of au fait, particularly with cultural politics in Russia, that, I mean, there's been obviously this sea change that's happened uh, since 2012, since Putin came back as president, but even more so in 2014. And in a way, Fyrstok embodies that because there was this quite unusual yeah, period uh, when there was a Moscow head of culture, Sergei Kapkov, who was quite liberal, quite progressive. And to some extent, even the federal policy from 2000 on, there were some limited attempts to support contemporary playwriting with small grants, quite small sums of money, but nevertheless, things that really <laughs> made a difference. <laughs> they supported, <laughs> Yelena will correct me if I'm wrong, months. but I'm fairly mm -hmm. sure they supported the Lyubimovka Festival, which promoted new playwrights, and really is one of the most important initiatives um, for contemporary playwriting. Um, then, in um, one of Yelena's colleagues was telling me, um, that Sergei Kapkov, um, in fact, tr tried a different tactic before this tactic that we're talking about now, um, and offered Sophia to Doc, as well as giving a few <coughs> grants to the company, not for their artistic work, but for educational projects and social projects, took a different tack, which is one they've taken with other theatres as well, and said, look, we, we like your work, we'd like to, give, we'd like to support you um, and make you a state theatre. Now, anyone who knows Russia understands <laughs> that this is a sort of a mixed <laughs> uh, offer. Uh, sure. Because once you're a state theatre, they have the power to appoint the artistic director and the mm -hmm. producer and also then remove them at any time they want. They can't necessarily interfere with the artistic program, but effectively they have the veto over you. So, of course, Theatre Dog refused that. Um, subsequent <laughs> to this, uh, they have continued to put on these works which nobody else is touching on themes that no one else is touching. And uh, they're t now taking an opposite tactic. Sergei Kapkov, of course, has since been effectively fired. And the, the uh, temperature in the country has changed as well. Um, but there's been this, this very sort of sudden change. A, a qu quick question for, for both of you. Just give me a short answer, because we could talk about it for hours. Mm. How do you describe the current Russian political system? Democracy, dictatorship, <laughs> postmodern authoritarian <laughs> state? <laughs> what, 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 what? What in a sentence or two would you call it? Where, where are we at post-2012? Um, I, I haven't yet come across a term that I really sort of think encapsulates it yet. But I think... I, I have one, but that's for oh, okay. later. Yeah, no <laughs> but, I mean, I would point to a few things. I mean, firstly, there's quite a sort of corporatist, neo-liberal neo thing that's happening there, which is actually strangely similar to here, although in a more exaggerated form. The only difference is that the corruption is endemic and very sort of overt there, whereas here it all, everything's very legal, but the corporations have their sway. In Russia, it's sort of much more, you know, the, the state controls the corporations and they sort of, they take the precedent. Um, but uh, I was reading something recently about a human rights um, commentator saying that, you know, on top of all the authoritarian tendency that has been going on since Putin came back in 2012 and, and has been sort of shutting down all the possible outlets where a dissent could happen um, in the last sort of literally two or three weeks uh, is an interesting comment. It's a whole new scale. People with individual pickets, that's, you're not allowed to protest necessarily if they don't give you permission um, as a group. So people would go out and protest with a single picket and they can't stop you, but even those people are now being arrested. Uh, even someone posting something on social media is being put in prison for you know two weeks or whatever, but nevertheless imprisoned. So it's, it's a whole new gear change in the political uh, life of Russia, even in the last couple of weeks. Okay, uh, Yelena, wh what's your answer? How do you describe the system in Russia today? No, это достаточно сложно, наверное, в одной фразе описать. To form it, um, formulate in one, in one sentence. Uh, ну, я попробую. Я думаю, что сейчас uh, государство у нас uh, перестало выполнять свои функции. I think um, currently the state has has stopped uh, fulfilling any of its functions. Uh, даже в том uh, виде, в каком оно выполняло в советское время. Even uh, as it acted in the Soviet times, that it, that the duties it fulfills, it even stopped doing that now. Uh, то есть лю людей не лечат, людей не учат, людей не защищают. So people aren't being treated in hospitals, people aren't being educated, people aren't being protected, their rights aren't being protected. И что самое, вот, мне кажется, там ужасное для меня вот в путинской власти, это то, что uh, все больше и больше уничтожаются социальные лифты, 
and the worst of all in the Putin's regime for me for in, in his power is that the um, social elevators kind of any kind of social v verticals are, are being completely d destroyed потому что например там наша система образования которая достаточно была хорошей э, когда сейчас э, ну, делаются платные практически э, ну, все кроме самых каких-то базовых так сказать э, ну, э, э, предметов э, в общем получается так что э, бедные люди или там недостаточно богатые они никогда не смогут в принципе дети вообще нету э, возможностей э, перспектив им получить образование so whereas before we did have quite good education um, the education system was successful and people could be successful after graduating whereas now um, everything is becoming uh, nothing is state funding uh, funded uh, so everything is becoming um, basically you have to pay for almost all of the subjects in state schools so the syllabus includes just very very basic subjects and everything else has to be paid by the parents which means of course that people after graduating from those schools and universities they they will have much less opportunities in life поэтому вот это государство без государства которое ставит себе какие-то выморочные цели типа вот война в сирии давайте мы там немножко побомбим в сирии понимаете так сказать где-то а то что здесь происходит здесь это ну как бы уже хаос и это в общем не важно что происходит с твоим населением тут so there's sort of a state within a state and and that state is more bothered by some sort of far-fetched ideas and and missions such as the war in syria rather than actually uh, taking care of what's happening of its own population, what's happening within their country. Поэтому вот это отчуждение государства от цели государства, да, вот это, мне кажется, то, что больше всего характеризует. Но к этому есть еще как бы, ну, оборотная сторона этого, это нарастание горизонтальных связей между людьми здоровых, которые пытаются эти какие-то проблемы там решать без участия государства. So on the one hand, that kind of failed state within a state, is 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 what is the, the system the current system nowadays on the other hand kind of the positive of what's happening in russia currently is that there are those um horizontal kind of links connections between people that are being established re-established now I i'm going to open it up to the audience in a minute i've just got a couple uh more uh questions than, than what we'll throw it open um wh what what i'm intrigued by is what wh are these good times for artists for playwrights for, for novelists or bad times um, I mean, because maybe it's actually good times. I think that for artists, all times are good. <laughs> Вот, и мне кажется, что вот это вот время и художник, они всегда, так сказать, в очень сложных отношениях находятся, это прекрасно. And I do think that time and artists, they have a very complex relationship, which I think is beautiful. Okay, that, that sounds like a good point to uh, throw it open to questions. Anyone got any questions? You have a question here in front of you? Okay. Um, Philip and I both worked for decades with uh, Russian dissidents during the Soviet period, and it's very, very, uh, it's very, very beautiful to see to see mm -hmm. somebody putting on plays and with real spirit now. It's uh, very beautiful. But uh, uh, I dealt particularly with the Sikushki for the psychiatric prisons, Orel, Dnipropetrovsk, Kazan, and the Selsky Institute in Moscow. And these were effectively criminal operations. Uh, they were murdering people with psychotropic drugs. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there was a pride in the mm. Soviet period in the medical system, like Cuba. Um, half the doctors who come to see your play must have been in the Soviet period. I mean, the 40, 40 years of a doctor's career, a third of them maybe were in the Soviet system. How differently did the modern young doctors and the older doctors react to your play? Ну, мне кажется, что тут все равно 
настоящие врачи же, они очень мало политически ангажированы. Для них, у них жизнь, в общем, в чем-то, как у людей театра, это такое служение. Человек, ну, рано утром, он в 8 утра уже в больнице, целый день там проводит, и, значит, еще у него дежурство. Поэтому человек, в принципе, жизнь врача, она посвящена его жизни как врача. The majority of them, so they're just like people of art. Uh, they dedicate their whole life to, to, to their profession. So they get up early in the morning and they spend the whole day uh, treating people, helping people, and then they go into uh, you know night shifts. И я знаю очень много пожилых врачей, которые ну совершенно как бы занимались только действительно своим делом, и это и было их дело. А для таких вот ну дел всегда были такие там партийные функционеры, такой, знаете, зам, начальника, там, не знаю, или там главврач. Вот он, так сказать, в основном занимается чем-то таким. Ну, это было, так сказать. Ну, нет, я не имею в смысле диссидент. В советское время, я думаю, что если мы и говорим сейчас про советскую психиатрию, то это одна отдельная вообще тема. И я думаю, что это просто, ну, такие злодеяния, которые, так сказать, еще как бы... Я просто думала, вообще врачи, так сказать, мы говорим про вообще врачей. Вообще, да. Вообще, да. In general, the difference between doctors is, Ильян says, I know quite a lot of doctors who are quite... Кардиохирург, какой-нибудь кардиохирург или... Elderly. Или там еще кто-то, он как бы вам мало имеет отношения к злодеям. Party people, you know, who were with the hospital. So it's rare that um, the real doctors would be involved in something. Да, но и сейчас есть врачи, которые, например, связаны с тюремной системой, которые просто выполняют всю грязную работу. Я могу просто, мы же у нас спектакль про дело Магнитского, там это ну подробно, очень много про это нам известно. So today actually it also happens what happened in the Soviet times. So we there are doctors who would be who are connected with the party, with the current party, with the government, who will be fulfilling those kind of dirty tasks and in the um, play about Magnitsky the Magnitsky case there's actually a lot about it how that that happens там до сих пор люди, ну как бы все, значит, ну, э, преступники практически, которые при этом уходят от наказания обычно, э, человек там по прозвищу доктор смерть, который, так сказать, э, death, э, который там получает удовольствие от того, что, так сказать, что ну да, в общем, так что это все все живо, к сожалению, да. So yeah, it's still, still very much alive, but it's kind of as far as I'm saying, you know, it's kind of a different category of doctors. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions, Lady Hit? Uh, um, I, I was wondering, just listening to the panel, that there's a wonderful reading, but I was wondering how it was shaped. Could you put these two together? Because I was listening yeah. to what you heard with respect to Paul Schools being a war monument, so I'm just interested in that. Do you want to take that? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's quite unusual, actually, because the Theatre Doc, their slogan is the theatre where there's no acting. And they, you know, a lot of the work is quite directly <coughs> in engaging the audience. And this script appears to be one where, you know, it of course it is testimony. And it could be done in a very um, simple way like that. But actually, the director Pankov, he um, he was sort of pioneering this form with music and and singing. So in fact, it was done in a very lively production where where the actors, I think there's six or seven actors on stage, in fact, and they're sort of singing and bringing this to life. So it was a, it was an unusual production for Theatre Doc. Я хочу еще сказать, что там в главной роли, в главной роли там очень хороший артист Андрей Заводюк, просто замечательный. Андрей Заводюк plays the main role and he's a great, great actor. Замечательный артист, действительно харизматик и с очень какой-то вызывающий огромное сочувствие, вызывающий огромное сочувствие в зале. And there's great empathy. The audience always feel great empathy towards him. Он эмоциональный центр спектакля. It's the emotional center of the play.
Okay, uh, we can probably do a couple more. Does anyone else want to come here? Yeah. I've got one for you, Luke, actually. Well, do me, do me <laughs> at the end. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, uh, leave, leave, me, leave me for now. We'll leave you later. I just yeah, wanted to hear what that sentence was that you were going to offer us earlier on about your view of the condition. Well, I, I, okay, well, briefly, I wrote a book called Mafia State, and I think it's probably up. Yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah. So j just uh, uh, sort of a couple, couple of last things. Um, I, I was following on from that question. I was very struck by the genre because um, I get there are so many clever Russians I know who write novels which are dark, satirical, uh, fictional accounts of contemporary Russia, which normally involve a dwarf. N no dwarf prizes for guessing who the dwarf is. Yeah, um, Yeah, yeah, novels. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but you know what they are doing is is something totally. Uh, okay, well we, don't, I think we know who the dwarf is, but uh, they are doing something totally different, which is to do kind of verbatim, you know, a, a, a slice of life, rather than doing this kind of dark fable that all the novelists are doing. Why, why that genre? Why not satire or something something more like fiction writing? Ну, господи. Дело в том, что вот документальный театр, который обязательно сопровождается исследованием. The thing is that jockey theatre, which always has a lot of research to it. И в ходе этого исследования обычно видишь, как штампы, с которым, которые ну, невольно у тебя были в начале исследования, как они все опрокидываются. And during the research, you see immediately how those cliches um, and those stereotypes that you, you had, they, they, they dissolve. И в этом и есть ценность документа, потому что жизнь всегда на самом деле интереснее и неожиданнее наших о ней представлений. That is the value of the document, because life is more often much more interesting and much more surprising and uh, unexpected than we can imagine. И она не укладывается вот в эти какие-то схемы черное, белое. Плохое, хорошее. This doesn't fall into the into the stereotypical uh, sort of forms of black and white, white, good and bad, good and evil. И у меня не раз было так, что когда я начинала какое-то исследование, у меня было, предположим, одно мнение какое-то о предмете, а потом выяснялось, что оказывается все иначе. So often when I when I start my research on the subject, I have my own opinion. Um, uh, on the subject, and then uh, throughout the research, it completely changes. Ну вот такая у нас спектакль шел тоже много лет. Двое в своем доме. Это документальный спектакль про белорусскую оппозицию. So we had um, recently um, a play called <laughs> two, two, two people in the mm -hmm. in the house. Двое в своем доме, да. Two 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 in your home. Two in your home. Uh, which is about the Bela, uh, the Bela Russian uh, uh, opposition. No, на самом деле двое в своем доме это КГБшники. Oh, so the two in your house, they are the KGB people. И дело было в посвящено истории настоящей домашнего ареста претендента в президенты. So it's a true story of a house arrest of one of the uh, opposition leaders who was um, a presidential um, candidate. И он, значит, этот человек жил полгода под домашним арестом в маленькой квартире крошечной с женой и двумя КГБшниками, которые все время Сменялись. <laughs> Вот драма в спейс. И наша группа поехала туда, в Минск. 
И расспрашивала участников событий. И привезла мне много-много кассет. And they brought lots of tapes back to me. Они все были очень интересны. They were very interesting. Но там было совсем не то. But it wasn't what I was expecting at all. It was, it, was a, it was the comedy of the space rather than the tragedy of the space. Because the young wife who was prior to their arrest was a housewife. Такого, ну, человек, который много старше, такой очень популярный, заслуженный, она там бывшая секретарша, которая что-то там, ну, готовила все время. А тут она стала публичной персоной. So the the man who was under the uh, under arrest, the presidential candidate, he he was a well known um, man, uh, and his wife was just just you know a former secretary housewife, whereas. Uh, while the story happened and completely flipped on its head and she became quite a <laughs> well-known person all of a sudden public figure и она абсолютно от страха от мужа она абсолютно была просто в настоящей ярости и страха она не ведала and she she knew not uh, she did not know any fear uh, so uh, the fear that she felt in her husband it just it completely it ignited anger in her, um, yes, she, she did not know fear. И она по-настоящему просто, ну, как бы преследовала этих КГБшников, и они страшно боялись. So she pursued the KGB officers, and they were terrified of her. То есть, например, история была такая, что она, значит, когда они там у себя включали смотреть какой-то футбольный матч. So they would turn on the KGB, KGB у себя, но они все время уже скучно, понимаете? They were bored, so they had to do something that would turn on the little telly to watch football. And there's penalties, for example, happening. <laughs> she comes in and she turns it to her favorite soap opera. And, and they watch soap opera. <laughs> that, um, that she, she doesn't like, but she would turn, turn the channel to a soap opera. <laughs> and she would sit and watch. Maria, I don't like you, Peter. So Maria would say, uh, uh, I don't love you anymore, Peter. <laughs> and she хоть одну секундочку переключить, нам счет узнать. And she sits and just watches it while the KGB officers come up and say, could you please change the channel just for one second so we know the score. Она говорит, тихо. It's just silence. Петр, я люблю тебя, Мария. And she says, Петр, I love you, Maria. Вот. И такого было очень много. So there was lots of instances like that. Что-то не вошло. Но она действительно своим таким бесстрашием, это был скорее средневековый фарс про то, как она... И они там в, к ним в квартиру шли со слезами, потому что... So, basically, some of it has um, become part of the play, uh, not all of it has, uh, has made it um, into the script, but there were so many instances, and she was completely fearless, um, and... Ну, там в других, другим арестованным, там они все было как обычно. Арестованные э, пили с ними чай, старались им понравиться. А к, туда они шли, значит, ой, только не коги, только не коги. So it kind of turned into a medieval farce, really. And uh, so the, and the story goes that some KGB officers, they would, they would just be, go, they would go to the bosses crying, saying, anybody else, we can go and, sh you know, and into a shift, into any other house arrest, but not Olga, please, not Olga. <laughs> Вот, но это вот история про то, как жизнь оказывается намного интереснее, чем. So this is a story how life actually is so much more interesting than anything you can come up with. И такое бывает практически в каждом исследовании. And this basically appears happens in every every uh, research that we take. So um, I, I want to wind this up. I just before we go, I, I just want to ask perhaps um, uh, Yelena and Nara to, to just tell us a little bit about the other plays that are going to be on this week. I mean, could you just do two minutes? Tell us what's Sure, sure, What's sure. coming? Absolutely. I mean, there's quite a range of plays, and they're, they're quite different as well. So tomorrow we have uh, Jeanne, um, Joan, which is a, a, a fictional play about um, a businesswoman who came to prominence in the 1990s, which is this very key year in Russian history, um, and is rather <laughs> ruthless. Um, and it's about her plight, and it's a, a, fictional, a fictional work. Then we have Grandchildren, which is another documentary play. Uh, on Thursday, 
and that is um, about the grand sort of Stalin's grandchildren, if you like, uh, the people who are the grandchildren of those prominent members of the Stalinist regime, how they relate to their grandparents and the, the difficulties you face, the internal emotional difficulties of being that, that grandchild, and how you perhaps are more forgiving to your grandparent than your rational, uh, you know, you rationally might condemn to condemn the system, but the emotional turmoil is, is different story. And on Friday, um, Misha Durnenkov, another sort of prominent uh, member of Theatre Doc, um, has written a play, that the, um, the War Hasn't Yet Started, and it's uh, another fictional work, which um, is rather more metaphoric, unlike the documentary works, but in a very interesting way, deals with the tensions within Russian society at the moment. Yelena, anything you'd like to add? Ну, они все, это все очень, я знаю эти тексты, они все очень интересны, заслуживают внимания. All I can add is, um, I know very well all those plays, and they're very interesting, and um, pl please do come in. разные какие-то течения, так сказать. And they're very different in their, in their approaches. But, um, мне кажется, они все вместе дадут какое-то представление. All together they should give you a very good idea uh, of what, what's happening. Great, uh, Yelena, Noah, thank you very much. Great session, lots of fun. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Stella.